I'm joined by Mark Newman of Constrained Capital. Mark, great to have you on Forward Guidance. Uh, tell me, why is your firm called Constrained Capital? What, what are you going for there? Hey, good to see you, Jack. Thanks for having me. So Constrained Capital uh, emanated from sort of the idea that constraints exist within the market uh, and the imposition of constraints sort of results in malinvestment and misallocation of capital in general. And the biggest constraints in the market of the past decade or so uh, has been around ESG. So that was really the impetus in creating constrained capital and um, you know developing that first thesis around the constraints of ESG and how that impacts markets and investors and the finance industry overall. Let's talk about ESG. So, you know, Mark, we were actually roommates at Camp Kotak. And by the time this interview airs, people will know all about Camp Kotak. Um, but, you know, just to give people a sense of the type of guy you are, you, know, you asked, so what your podcast host, what's your favorite episode of, of your show? And, you know, that question typically catches me a little bit off guard because I'm like, do I pick one or something? So I, so I said, okay, well, let me, let me look and go at my, my episodes. And you're like, Jack, look, I like you, but you, you got to do a lot better than that. Okay, so that's the, that's the type of type of person you are. So y- using that to help the audience and me understand how you approached ESG. What well, when was ESG started? What was the promise of an ESG? When was the first time you heard about ESG? And then when did you realize, hmm, you know, something's not kind of adding up here between the promise and what is actually in these funds? Right. Actually, ESG investing sort of birthed from SRI, socially responsible investing, and it's actually been around a while. If you go back and think of you know, even the, the sin stocks, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, sort of, you're shunned from owning those. Those are societally bad and you can't own those and you shouldn't own those. If you're really, let's say in the past, devoutly religious, you wouldn't invest in alcohol or tobacco type uh, investments. And that's sort of how constraints work. And with ESG, the environmental, the social, the governance, um, that's really become the acronym over, let's say, the last decade or so. Uh, SRI started in, in Europe in the 70s and 80s, and it's been around a bit, and it's sort of morphed and evolved. Um, Europe was the leader originally, then Asia picked up Japan, and then in the last decade or so, the U.S. has really um, you know, gotten its arms around ESG, and I think that some of the industry has seen it as sort of a new shiny object to gain investors' uh, funds to put to work in that in those investment theses. And unfortunately, Ben, this is where sort of my um, my uh, sort of CFA charter holder, like take notice flag popped up in that constraints on capital cause misallocation of funds and, and malinvestment overall. And I think that there's some false pretenses associated with ESG in the sense of saying good, this is a good idea, let's appeal to everyone's sense of like being virtuous versus doing good and what are they actually doing? What are the measured effects of ESG? And for me, um, the evolution of ESG, I really took notice, let's call it five to seven years ago. Uh, In 2015, 16, ESG was sort of in every, at least where I was looking, every place. And then um, in 2017, that's really when the assets under management under the ESG umbrella really exploded. And that's where I dug into sort of investigate top to bottom, both from the uh, provider's side, so Wall Street grabbing an idea, and from the investor side, what are they seeing and hearing and being told versus where does the reality and the value and the investment uh, knowledge base um, and decision making come from in the ESG field? And and, and, And for me, it was really about trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and what's real and what's measurable, and what's impactful versus what's opinion and what's theory as opposed to um, actual quantifiable um, numbers that you can point to and say, here are the benefits. So what is something that is theory, maybe a little bit fluffy, that a lot of folks who work in ESG, and it has become you know, a good uh, professional field, or people who allocate to ESG that they believe that you say, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm just not seeing it? Right. So... The E, the environmental side, the S, the societal, and the G, the governance, right? Those are the three pillars of the ESG stool. Um, there's, ver- there's not enough in there, in my opinion, that's quantifiable. Yes, you can measure carbon output 
and carbon input and the uh, byproducts, let's say, that are um, given off by these companies and their investments and, and where they're, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the S, the societal, right? That's sort of someone's opinion on what's good. And that one is super hard to quantify. Um, what you think of Jack as the most important things in your ESG mindset, environment, social, governance, is going to be different than what I think. And it's going to be different what the next guy thinks. So to rank the different elements of E, S, or G in any sort of order is very personal. It's not some panacea. Oh, BlackRock determined that this is ESG and they're going to push that story. That becomes sort of what I'd say a little bit of sort of the lazy man's, I'm invested in ESG, but I really have no idea what I own. So I think that, you know, as far as it goes, um, the saying good versus doing good disparity within ESG is the big problem because not a lot of the theory behind ESG is statistically provable. Oh, I mean, look, I believe in diversity and, and getting varied opinions on a decision within a team. Absolutely. I am an environmentalist. I mean, you and I, we hung out in Maine. We enjoyed nature. We went on a hike. I swim in the lake. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm active. Um, so I do what I can to make sure I don't impact the environment in a negative way. I do what I can to make sure decision-making within a group has diverse opinions. But it's hard to impose my view, let's say, on a company or on an investment thesis as opposed to what's provable. What is actually measurable? And I think that that's where sort of Wall Street's version of ESG has gotten a little bit clouded. It's really become focused on gathering assets, gathering uh, momentum in making statements, and a little less focus on actual investment results that are measurable. So yeah, there are two core claims of ESG. Number one is that allocating to ESG funds makes the world in, in a variety of different ways a better place. And number two is that ESG at the very least doesn't hurt your investment returns, how much you know, money you, you, you get paid back, investment returns, or it, if anything, it could actually improve investment returns. That second claim, I know you've done a lot of work, you've consulted with well, a lot of you know, professors on, on that topic, but let's just talk about the first one. And I realize that the first topic about making the world a better place, it is inherently uh, um, subjective. You know, if, if you want to drill a lot less oil, if you want to drill a lot more oil, uh, I mean that you know that that, that is a, a, an opinion. I mean it's uh, uh, you know carbon emissions environment impact on, on the environment. There's a lot of data there, but about what is good, that, that inherently is a very subjective claim. But let's say by not investing in oil funds, and if most people invest in ETFs or, or uh, um, ESG initiatives that own a lot of stuff, all all stuff except for oil, nuclear, tobacco, alcohol, gambling, and you can tell me what the sixth one is because I forget. Uh, uh, um, do those actually cause that to occur less in the in the real world? So if if you know a lot a lot fewer people, a lot and fewer investors are allocated to the oil sector, does that impact the actual drilling? Does that you know people uh, uh, oil CEOs are drilling less? If people own fewer tobacco stocks, are they selling fewer tobacco stock? Or if it's selling you know fewer cigarettes, what does it actually do to the behavior? So that's a great question, and let me give you a couple examples in each of those sectors. Okay, so tobacco. Let's just look at that one for a sec. I don't smoke. I do not smoke cigarettes. I, tobacco has never been a thing. So I don't. Um, but there's a big dividend in there. And, you know, there are a lot of people who still rely on nicotine and tobacco as part of their life. And I'm not passing any judgment on them. I'm looking at it from the, uh, you know, investment thesis behind a, a company like Philip Morris or Altria. Now, during the Ukraine war, Philip Morris sent, I think the number was 500,000 cartons of cigarettes to the Ukraine soldiers. So on the one hand, tobacco is bad in the ESG world. Ironically, by the way, yes, their product is not great, but from their governance and, their, and the way they run their company, diversity, uh, you know, caring for their workers, caring for their employees, they actually score very high but for their product itself, okay? So we could talk about, is it ESG or something? Is it being nice to the society, if you will? They're fighting a war. 
here are some cigarettes to help you pass the time. Now, again, I'm not passing judgment on whether you should smoke or not smoke, but Philip Morris has made an overture to say, we're going to make life on the front line a little bit more, you know, manageable, however you want to. So is that ESG? It's tobacco company. And then let's also now talk about weapons. Okay. That's the sixth, uh, that's the sixth sector in my, in my group. The ES, the, the, most of the ESG supporters, proponents say, we've got to defend Ukraine and we've got to help the Ukraine. Look, I, I'm not a warmonger, right? I don't believe in war as a solution really, but I'm not in charge. Um, but for a very long time, the weapons companies were non ESG, were, were ESG exclusions. They were part of the orphans. They're, they make weapons of war. So then we give the Ukraine $100 million, $100 billion. 100 billion? I lose track. Billions, millions? I think it's billion overall, right? It's not 100 million. That wouldn't, that'd be an odd yeah, Definitely lot. not, yeah. That's an odd lot. So 100 billion goes there. Ukraine is not buying McDonald's and Coca-Cola with that money. They're, they're buying weapons. But the irony is the ESG world has not been allowed technically to buy weapons companies. So what are we talking about here? Are we giving them weapons to make sure that they pacify the world and avoid greater bellicosity? That's ESG friendly, I think, but they're not allowed to buy those stocks. So this is the inherent conflict of, 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 of ESG. And again, I, I think it's sort of false pretenses in a way to let's shape the narrative with your flows and we'll buy the companies or we'll support the companies that are in our view good. And that's where the inherent problem lies. Who's the decider on what's good? Is it Larry Fink? Is it Larry Fink, the guy who's saying- CEO of BlackRock, who, who- Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, the CEO of BlackRock, who's built that company into a behemoth that's arguably a monopoly. We, we don't need to go there right now, but their narrative, and Larry Fink said himself, we're gonna shape behaviors, we're gonna push behaviors. So that's, again, constraints, misallocating capital, to where Larry Fink thinks is the best decision. But his best decision is based on how can I gather so many assets? Not because I love ESG as the environment, social, and the governance. No, he really loves AUM and fees. So he can sell that story as here's the ESG answer to your prayers. We have this ESG fund. And part of the conflict, again, we talk weapons, we talk tobacco. Let's talk about the little bit of malinvestment and misallocation of capital that goes with this. So we starved the energy companies. So Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, those coal. are the villains. Those are the villains. There was, yeah, there was a coal ETF, but I don't think it exists any longer. KOL, yeah, it was there. Um, but the point there is they starved those companies. Those companies underperformed. But in the end, don't we need fossil fuel to keep society going? and to get us to wherever the future of energy is. We do, but so everyone was shadowed, uh, shield, uh, sent away from those. And in fact, I think there's probably banking deals. Larry Fink may be telling the banks, don't lend these guys money if they're practicing oil and gas. And that, again, further constrains on the oil fossil fuel sector. So there to me is the opportunity because I believe we're gonna need these companies. And ESG has, again, constrained and misallocated capital away from these important vital companies. Nuclear energy, same thing. And the weapons, as I said, you know, they're going to be vital going forward. Now, on the micro basis, right, the micro level, look at Amazon. That has been determined a decently well-behaved ESG company. So it has a high ESG score. Yes. And so I get, a, and I use Amazon. I'm not, I'm not saying Amazon's a bad company. I'm just saying it's not ESG because the logistics, the cardboard boxes, the uh, Amazon web services, that uses a lot of energy and Jeff Bezos is not the most friendly to the unions, like we know. No, not at all, but yeah. So how is it the number three holding at all these ESG funds? Because it's the number three, it's the biggest company pretty much. Well, right, so, so here, let, now let's get to this. This is important, Jack. And we talked about saying how ESG funds and ESG companies are doing better. Well, between 2017 and 21, the NASDAQ had a rip. Apple, Google, Amazon. So we talked to Amazon. 
Apple, Foxconn, you know, rel- you know, net zero, meaning I buy your carbon credits and I can pollute. I don't know that I buy into that Google net zero type things. There's a lot of flaws in their analysis in ESG and that we can get into the ratings agency and stuff like that. But again, I launch an ESG fund and I'm really beta, really uh, benchmark to the S&P. So I have to buy what the top holdings of the S&P looks like, which happens to be what the Qs look like, the big five or seven, right? Apple, Google, Microsoft, you know, uh, uh, NVIDIA, Tesla, and Amazon or whatever. You know, we know what the big five or six or seven are. But all the new funds that launch ESG, they're all flowing into those same names. Because those seven percent of the S and P is Apple. If I don't hold Apple, I'm losing to the benchmark. So um, the performance in 2017 to 21, where all these large cap techs really led the way, that made people in ESG say, "See, we bought these ESG funds, and they really did great." Well, let's strip out the big five or six tech names that aren't really ESG that you included, and your funds lagged. So that's the misconception, misperception of ESG funds outperforming. They only outperform because in the last five years prior to 22, there was this massive flow towards these big funds, free, easy money, pile in, and hey, I'm launching an ESG fund, and my ESG fund looks like the 50, 100, 150 out there that are already there that own the same stocks. So that's the conflation of sort of ESG outperformance. What do you think of the six categories? What is the most underowned? Because I could make a case that oil and gas stocks are now not overowned, but they're owned. I mean, there's XLE, and you know everyone on CNBC is talking about the oil stocks. But uh, yeah, which I mean, number one, would you agree with my statement that oil is you know owned, not 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 vastly underowned, maybe slightly underowned? And then what is vastly underowned? Nuclear. Yeah. So oil in the past two to three months, okay, has seen an uptick and a balance. And I think that's part of the rotation, you know, as people look at, look at tech and see how big it's moved and realize what has lagged, in which case it has been fossil fuel. And so, yes, in the last two to three months, there's been an uptick in ownership. It's still low. And look at the, at the trough of energy weighting as a percentage of the S&P. I think it was like, I want to say 2.3, 2.5. 2.7% somewhere in like late 2021. So in November 2021, energy bottomed. And that was like nearby where percentage allocation uh, in the S&P was near historic lows. Yes. Yeah, Mark, and, sorry, sorry, but I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a nerd. And so you, you can make fun yeah. of me, but you know, people, people make the point that nothing is ever over-owned or under-owned. Everyone always, the po- investing public always owns 100% of something. So when you say, you know, the as, uh, energy uh, as a percentage of S&P was 1.8%, and now it's probably closer to 4 or, or 5%, and it peaked at 30% in, you know, 2007 and 8, uh, people could say that's justified by fundamentals. You know, when when the price of oil was at 30 bucks and we had this global pandemic that, you know, no one was flying or, you know, commercial activity was down, like that, that made rational sense. So I, what I'm just trying to say, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying it's hard to isolate the fundamentals from, oh, uh, Larry Fink said not to own this, so let's not own this. Sure. And I think that's super important, Jack. It's a really good point because there is, well, if you go back and let's just talk fundamentals for a second. Oil was 100, it was 140 at one point in, in 2008, 2008 nine, yeah, yeah. in there. If you go back, and look at where oil was then, where gas was then, and compare it to the prices of these stocks, where they were then versus where, you're gonna look at those two and say, nah, there's something else other than the fundamental story here. I don't know what percentage to assign to that, and it's a fair point you make, but think about it from the, I'm a big fund manager, and I have an ESG mandate flashing across my board, my email every day, So if at the end of a quarter or the end of a year, you're going to say, hey, here's my portfolio, what percentage of your constituents, your investors, your clients are going to say, you own ExxonMobil? I don't want that in my portfolio. It's it's killing the environment. Whether it is or not is a debatable one, but that, you know, the cover your butt element of what my portfolio looks like and who's watching and who can see it is a it has more influence now than it did. So back to the question of which is the most underowned. 
I'm going to, I might say it's tobacco. And look, when I look at these things and it could be alcohol too, and we'll get into that in a minute, but, um, I look at each of these sectors. So the six sectors that are the ESG exclusions, right? Fossil fuel, nuclear energy weapons. That's the new woke shame ish aspect. And then the old sin, tobacco, alcohol, gambling. And I look at these, not from the negative social blah, blah, blah scores that it gives me in my portfolio. What did they each provide that I would like to have as an attribute in my, for, for tobacco? It's high dividends, five, six, eight percent. I'll take that all day as, as a portion of my portfolio. Oil, well, look, I still live in this country where oil is a factor. Whether it's, look, not everyone's got an EV. I don't have any EVs. I still drive a car. I still heat my house, oil, gas, whatever. I have inflation risk on my day to day. I want to own some oil stocks. In case, like my 14-year-old son said, Dad, isn't oil going to 1,000 before it goes to zero? He's 14, 15. He gets it. So, like, I want some of that exposure, right? And so, look, the, 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 the nuclear space, if we're really ESG conscious, we have to look at the positive attributes of nuclear energy versus the negative. And you have to do that for all energy. Zero aspects. carbon, that's pretty positive. Zero carbon, right. And, 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 and a, pellet of, a pellet of uranium has more energy and power than a ton of coal. What are we talking about, right? So I look at these as all important pieces in bridging the energy gap from where we are now to what it looks like. We're not going to abandon these and say, hey, windmills and batteries and we're good. No, we're going to need to keep the, comp the um, factories powered and lit and, you know, look, Fossil fuel kept a lot of people from freezing to death and a lot of people from overheating. That's just basics. Like we need that. So when we talk about each sector and what's least owned, I look at it as which, which of these are least owned. And I think it could be tobacco would be my guess. I definitely think energy is still low. And what attributions do they provide to my portfolio? And, you know, looking at the whole basket of these, this is a non-correlated basket. It's got a good dividend. It, it, it screens like value and it's under owned. People do not own this. And here's the other thing, Jack, like when I look at dividend funds, the dividend yield on the index of ESG orphans is higher than a lot of the dividend funds. So I get dividends, I get value, I get under owned and I get real cash flow quality companies that we all know. So there's a, so many good attributes to that basket by itself. And then I add in, which is where I really think the kicker is, the pendulum and ESG. It's over here and all of a sudden there's pushback and everyone's saying, wait, ESG is not working and ESG is not all that it's cracked up to be. So as those groups of ESG investors, I'll say, you know what, I want out of that, I want into the rest of the universe. In that universe is a lot of these orphans that have been left alone. So on top of the value and the dividends and the cash flows, there's an under-owned reversion potentially that helps buttress these. Like if Exxon says, hey, I'm starting the green revolution in energy. Well, energy, <laughs> Exxon has the cash to do it. And even Chevron, I believe, they're one of the leaders in renewables. And so is NextEra in nuclear. Yeah, I was shocked to learn, Mark, that you, when you said next era energy, I, I'm, I'm not even going to say the ticker. I, I currently don't own it, but it, that they were uh, not, they had a low ESG score because of nuclear, because they are a leader in solar and nuclear, yes. both of That's which right. have very low carbon intensity. That's right. So I think that within the ESG uh, tossing aside of names, many, many have been in that dragnet that don't deserve to be. So this is an interesting thing that I thought about a lot. ESG is very personal. Very. You, Jack, you may rank carbon footprint higher or lower than, I don't know, diversity. I'm just making it up. But if you want to develop the Jack Farley ESG portfolio, that doesn't look like Mark Newman's ESG portfolio. We have to do it ourselves. There's no way right. Larry can do that for us. Right. So you, you would have to, and this is what makes it really difficult for the RIA community and, and the whole investment world. Let's talk about like Silicon Valley Bank. Okay. 
This is a perfect example of what we're talking about. Three-legged stool, E-S-G. And remind us what they stand for again. Uh, environmental, social, and governance, right? So SVB had a medium ESG risk ranking before it imploded. It's a bank that had no chief risk officer for eight months. They could be doing all the most magical things for the environment. They could have the most diverse workforce in history. But a bank without a risk manager for eight months, that's a zero in governance. That, that three-legged stool only has two legs. So as far as an ESG investment, Silicon Valley never makes the grade. It should never. But what did it do? Well, we have that ESG stamp, and there's a lot of people who did the work, maybe, and said, oh, this is part of our portfolio, and it's an ESG darling. Well, everyone got misled. Everyone was lazy and said, oh, if so-and-so is invested, they must have done the work. I'm in with them. And you see what happened. And I bet a lot of their, lo like a very small percentage of their loans were to fossil fuel initiatives, which is, you know, that probably helped their ESG score. That's, yeah, yeah. And the key point about this is that the scores are fundamentally arbitrary, in my, you know, opinion. You can tell us about this. And they pretend as if they're very uh, um, scientific. And for, for a perfect example is oil. Okay, investing in oil, that causes the stock to go higher so the company can issue shares or you know issue debt to uh, drill more and, and pollute more, which will uh, cause more carbon CO2 in the atmosphere, which will cause greater temperatures, greater climate change. That argument makes sense to me. But then why is, um, you know, you could also say nuclear energy is the most ESG thing in the world because it produces energy so it can replace that. Uh, you could say all this, you know, uh, um, electric vehicles. Yeah, if it's all from nuclear and and solar and wind, then that's very low uh, carbon emission. But if it's getting it from coal, maybe it's, uh, you know, if, if it's the electricity that's fueling the electric car is all from coal, maybe it's actually more ESG to do have a, you know, a very low uh, a hybrid or, or something like that. And uh, tobacco, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't smoke either. And I, I mean, I think it's a good thing that uh, you know tobacco companies cannot legally advertise. That, that's my personal opinion. That you know, I don't think people should attach a, a lot of a lot of weight to, and people have their own their own opinions. Um, but you could, you know, so, okay, so low ESG for that, for, low ESG for tobacco companies that that might make sense to me. But then, what about Coca Cola? Uh, you know, a lot of soft drinks are really a giant fueler of obesity at, at McDonald's a, a, as well. I might say smartphones are not great for people's mental health, which is maybe more important than you know, even more important than physical health. You know, we were recently in a, in a rem, you know remote area, and I feel great. You know, maybe if people walked around not on their cell phones all day, maybe they wouldn't have such you know uh, um, you know issues. And uh, I mean, those are the giant companies that are have all these great ESG scores. So I'm not saying my own view is right, uh, and that you know Larry Fink's view is wrong. I'm just saying it's arbitrary. And I think that a lot of ESG they market it to, according to what the time when the price of oil was at forty dollars, uh, oil is very low ESG. Then when the price of oil goes to one hundred and twenty dollars, maybe it gets a, a little bit more ESG because, you know, people uh, having a 10% inflation rate is not very good for society. I, I think that for the case of nuclear, it, that really shows maybe the financial incentives because the nuclear industry is, t as stock market cap is tiny. If they, like, there's not much money to be gained by having a nuclear ETF, you know, so that, so they can trash it. Whereas, uh, you know, they can't, they can't trash Apple. It's Apple's too big. So incentives, I think you really nailed it right there with that one. It's about incentives. Let's talk about Coca-Cola for a second, okay? Now, I have, uh, well, take a quarter step back. The, the cell phone thing, my daughter just came back from camp, and she said to me yesterday, I picked her up, and she said, I'm actually not excited about the cell phone. I'm like, what do you mean? You get to talk to your friend. She goes, actually, the last six or seven weeks without the cell phone, I was pretty happy. And that's important, and I think it's key, and it's really tough as a, as a, as a parent because I have three kids. It's like the cell phone. They're missing out. They're maybe their friends, but they're doing themselves better by not being in front of those phones. Anyway, let's talk about Coca-Cola for a second, okay? And I, because I have kids, like at schools, the vending machines have Coca-Cola, Doritos, candy bars, as what they're offering to kids in the school, borderline unregulated, right? Like, oh, I got a couple bucks, I'm buying sugar and whatever. Coca-Cola is the number one contributor, Pepsi and Coke. They're one, well, not number one. I don't want to use extremes, but top contributor to type 2 diabetes and obesity in our country. Okay? They have 
millions of plastic bottles with those plastic cups, okay? Like we could talk about the water, the water table and how it's polluted and we actually need a lot of, you know, clean water produced as opposed to drinking taps, but I don't want to get into that. Um, but in terms of, you know, so, so from an environmental perspective, Coke and Pepsi, the plastic bottles, that in itself is a big issue. And then societally, Coke and Pepsi and the obesity and diabetes cost our healthcare system more. I think it's 30 to 40% more. I can't remember the statistics that I uncovered. More problems society, societally and healthcare system wise than alcohol and tobacco problems. Missed work from, out, from being out, you know, whatever, and cancer and those kinds of things. But that's not a positive thing like alcohol, tobacco, and the, the negative ills. But the cost on our society is 40%, 34% less than diabetes and obesity each year. So someone, somewhere in the decision-making, the opinions on ESG, pushed Coke and Pepsi to be sort of okay ESG. Yeah, it's got medium risk, medium risk ESG, a score of 21.6 between zero and I guess severe is 40 plus. And it's actually the of 620 food products company in some index, it's the 32 number 32. So it's in the fifth, it's in the five percentile for being a great ESG company, apparently, according to where I'm re reading, Sustainalytics. Right, right. Well, so we, we could get into, you could probably look up five other rating agencies and see five other scores on Coca-Cola, which is part and parcel with it all. But in the end, right, Nuveen has a large cap dividend ESG fund. For a while there, I haven't looked recently, but Coke and Pepsi were top five holdings. Now there, an investment manager is saying, yeah, it scores okay ESG, and you and I can debate whether it does, but there's a big dividend there. And so someone choosing between dividends and ESG, they're conflating factors in their investment model. So there's no like, oh, this is the attribution is because of the dividend or because of the ESG. It's all pretty gray. I would look at it and say, look, you want to be an ESG? Fine. Don't own Coke and Pepsi. Or you want a big dividend, irrespective of ESG? Fine, Coke and Pepsi, British Tobacco, <laughs> Altria, those are big dividends. Like, you want to give your investor exactly what you're doing and why. And to say, I'm ESG, but I also like dividends, so I'm going to buy these fake ESG companies that score well, you're doing a disservice. And what do you, you know, does the investor know what they own and why? ExxonMobil and Tesla which has or had the larger ESG score and, and why? Right, so there was big news. I'm gonna say it was middle of last year, but Tesla, the electric vehicle company, everybody knows it's a cool car. I've driven a couple. I, I like some aspects of it, but finding batteries is a messy business. Elon is not the most friendly to employees and those kinds of things. And Elon himself, wild card for sure. ExxonMobil, we know what they do mostly, and they are one of the biggest, maybe if, maybe the biggest in the U.S. at least. So when they are working on their ESG score, filling out a due diligence questionnaire, you know, part of the questioning is, what are you doing about your fossil fuel profile? Have you sold off parcels and those kinds of things? Exxon has several public parcels of land that they wish to divest from and then improve their ESG score. So they turn and they sell parcels of land to private equity, some domestic, some not domestic, but uh, people capture that energy flow and they may be very likely could be less scrupulous because they're private, right? They're not publicly visible um, than the practices at say ExxonMobil in their day to day. So net net the energy flow, the production of oil doesn't change. And you might see even a decrease in the stringency, if you will, of producing that oil. Maybe they let some people go. Maybe they want to cut costs. I'm just making stuff up. But ExxonMobil's ESG score improves. They got rid of publicly visible parcels of oil producing lands. Um, Exxon's, like I said, ESG score improves. Tesla during that time period didn't really make many changes to the way they were doing business. So they sort of stood, they, they sort of stood stagnant. So on a relative basis, ExxonMobil's uh, tech score, uh, sorry, ESG score, excuse me, improves while 
Tesla's uh, does not. And I'll give you one more Exxon example in the world of ESG. So FTX, right? Um, Sam Bankman Fried's uh, crypto fraud. I've heard of it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) At one point on some metrics, they ranked higher than than, uh, than Exxon Mobil did. So that is sort of this example of it's better to be a, a fraud that says nice things about the environment every now and then than a company with good governance but just is in fossil fuels. And by the way, and by the way, so Exxon and Tesla now Exxon has a uh, higher risk score than Tesla now. Um but so so uh, a lower ESG score that than Tesla but uh but I can't, it was either the case that they at one point Tesla had a a lower ranking then Exxon, or I, I'm, I'm just reading now from University of Michigan Business School that a sustainability index kept Exxon but dropped Tesla. So, so yeah, and, and the point is that it's arbitrary, and that ES, uh, Exxon can boost its ESG score by selling fossil fuels. But are they selling it to a, a nature trust that's going to keep it there? No, they're selling it to a either a smaller publicly traded company or a private equity company that's going to drill it and likely drill it in a dirtier way than Exxon. Right, right, and, and you know. It, the two things. One, it stems from sort of the story you tell and how you position the narrative. And then the other is if you go from random uh, one rating agency to another, I imagine you would see a great variation. And um, that's part of the challenge, too. You know, here's the interesting stat I like to talk about, Jack, is the fees generated from the ESG industry are now into the billions. So when you think about keeping the shiny object shiny and moving and sort of continuously evolving into a new definition, there are a lot of people whose livelihoods depend on the ESG story. And you see articles written by, I don't know, I don't want to pick on anybody, XYZ Consulting or the chief sustainability officer at XYZ firm, or the head of sustainability at a law firm. And they'll say, we need to keep regulations going. We need to make more efficient rating systems and all these different things. It's this constantly evolving definition of something that's really undefinable. To me, it's the, it's the, it's, there's a racetrack, a dog track, and the hare is running around the track and all the dogs are chasing it. And the hare is ESG and ESG ruling and, and, and ratings. And they keep changing that and it runs faster and the dogs never catch it. But the better is still there and throw out their money on the dogs. And they continue to say, let's chase that hare. What does that hare look like? And that's a bit of um, the ESG sort of circle, circular game. And look, back in the um, 80s, we had junk bonds and Michael Milken. We had mortgage bonds and Louis Ranieri. And then even more recently, we had the GFC and the CDOs. And it was just sort of this good idea on some level, run amok by Wall Street. You know, as you got further and newer iterations, the risk reward got skewed and the narrative and the story got skewed. And then investors get drawn in and then there's this lopsided risk. You saw it in mortgage bonds, junk bonds, CDOs. I believe the last decade, the biggest bubble, bar none, bigger than crypto, bigger than SPACs, was ESG. And I still think there is tons of imbalanced risk reward yet to come out. I, I still think that that's out there somewhere. Okay, so yeah, I think you have a view on the downside, the risks of ESG that... Uh, it sounds like you think that they are they are large and very uh, averse. So I, I want to get into that. But just to, you said that the ESGU, the BlackRock iShares ESG Aware ETF, um, that had a higher beta to the S and P 500 than SPY, which pretty much is the uh, uh, the S and P 500. So yeah, the expense ratio for I, uh, SP, uh, IVV, the S and P 500 ETF, is three basis points. So ex- exceptionally cheap. Yeah. The expense Vo- ratio Vo- for, the same, right? VOO, same. Yeah. Yeah. The expense right. ratio for ESG aware, which owns 300 companies, which you said 15? had a higher beta at one time uh, is 15 basis points, which is still by no means you know, expensive at, at all, but it's just, you know, it's, it's five times higher. 
5X for the beta, right. And that's where the marketing skills uh, of a BlackRock and look, sort of the, I did some work and I am well in, well, reasonably well versed in the inner workings of how funds get bigger and smaller and who does the distribution and who, um, you know, has the attention of the investor and the ability to move their funds. I'll give you an example regarding ESGU. In the first quarter of this year, ESGU lost, I think it was $6 billion of flows. They went out. Where did they go? They went into QUAL, which is a quality stock ETF within the BlackRock umbrella. So the BlackRock investors said, we want out of ESG to $6 billion. Where should we put our money? And the BlackRock stable of advisors said, oh, go into QUAL. That's where you want to go, right? Kept it in-house and kept the investors, just moved them on to the next dog, right? In terms of the dog track I was telling you about. Now, ironically, is the overlap in QUAL and ESGU is more than you think. So that didn't really change the overall profile. The one of the things that was interesting to me in terms of the orphans and the exclusions, in the QUAL, there were like five or six of the orphans, right? So five names that were never touched because of ESG. Hey, Mark, explain your orphans, explain what the orphan is. I mean, I know. Well, okay, sorry. So the ESG orphans index is what I created. Uh, that was the six sectors, market cap weighted, fossil fuel, nuclear energy, um, 25% each, weapons, 21%. Alcohol, tobacco, 25%, and then gambling, a small sector market cap wise, was about 4%. But the flow, this discusses the flow and the, and the pendulum swinging. As people come out of these ESG funds, they go into the rest of the universe, if you will. And in that universe is these exclusions, these orphans that have been, that have not seen inflows. So as people shift out of the ESG funds, they shift into these orphans, which are under owned, as we talked about. There was another one, I want to say SSGE or SSEG, SEG. I don't know. There was a, a big um, Finnish mutual fund that switched out of two different uh, DWS securities. One was ESG into the other, which was climate action, $2 billion shift of funds. Again, more of the flow out of the ESG names and into everything else. So I think as we see a bit more of the ESG veil lifted, you will see folks saying, I need more diversification than what ESG provides, which is why these sectors, these under own ones, I still think are super interesting, not only from a value and a um, dividend and stuff like that, but they're under owned relative to the rest of the market. So on a rotation, um, you know, you could see movement back plus, and I don't want to get political at all. I don't want to get politically charged anybody in this, but the pushback from against the current administration is less ESG, right? The current administration is like more ESG. Last one, the, 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 the outside group is like less ESG. If you see a shift in the political leanings of things, you could see more regulation, more laws sort of shunning and chiding ESG which will cause investors and investment managers to diversify away from the narrower uh, universe of ESG, which is where I also, so, so there is a lot of factors, a lot of shots on goal, as we say, as to why this, this posture makes some sense, at least for the investor, investors diversifying their portfolios. All right. So, but make me the case that is a seismically large risk for investors who are in ESG funds that own 300 stocks that track the S&P 500 instead of the 500 stocks that track the S&P 500, make the case that they are actually going to suffer uh, adversely. Uh, I mean, they, they own Apple, they own Microsoft. They, those companies, they may be under, overvalued, but I mean, th those are quality companies. It's not as if you know ESG has gotten everyone into you know, stocks that are promising some sort of you know, green energy thing and, that, and, that, and the science doesn't work. I mean, those stocks exist and there have been a lot of promotions, but those stocks typically go down you know, quite rapidly after the IPO. Okay, so if I want to raise 50,000 bucks, meaning liquidate stuff, almost any stock would handle $50,000 worth of uh, redemption, if you will. What if I want to redeem a billion dollars? How many stocks can you do that with? So for example, 
Kathy Wood, if she is forced to redeem, how many shares of Ginkgo BioWorks can she really sell without destroying the stock, right? So if someone else says, I need to raise a billion dollars, well, it's probably two, two, three minutes of work in Apple or, or Amazon, right? So if enough people got a margin call, had a credit event, had some sovereign exposure to pick a country, Japan, if they lose control of the yield curve or whatever, and they need to raise money to make up for a margin call, they got to come hit the stocks they know and they own in size. And that's where, you know, one risk that exists out there, for example, the short interest in Apple, I think it's less than 1%. Is there any risk of a short cover in Apple? No. Is there a risk of who, like, who doesn't own Apple other than me? Okay. <laughs> who doesn't? So if someone says, oh my goodness, Apple hasn't grown in three quarters. Steve Jobs' ghost is haunting that place. And they're a phone company that trades and I don't even know the numbers. It's 27 times. I, I, don't, I haven't looked recently. But it's like, I got to raise a lot of money. Apple. <laughs> a million for sale. Yeah, but Mark, you know that in periods of market stress, they sell Apple but the stocks that go down the most are the small cap ones that have, you know, I mean, look, coal companies did not do well in March 2020. Oil company, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, what, typically, actually, the, aren't, aren't Apple the companies that are hit the least because they're well, the okay? Companies? So, so you're 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 in, injecting a correlations go to one type environment, right, where everything is for sale, and I think that's a fair point you make. Um, in March 2020, for example, everything was for sale, right? Nobody knew anything and everyone was like, the unknown is here, out. Whereas I look at it as, oh, I have a margin call somewhere else. I just, just need to raise 50 million bucks. Okay. It's easier to just sort of hit something I'm very long and is very liquid. Um, yes, in an environment, Jack, where things all go together, sure. The higher beta, riskier stocks will suffer more. Agreed. I was talking um, less a general macro contagion as more of a portfolio emergency based on I need cash for my portfolio. Um, there's a little bit of a difference, you know, when it all goes to all of those pear shapes and everything is sold, yes, the least owned will have four sellers that move the stock greater. I agree with that. But in general markets, um, something happening somewhere that's not a market correlated to one event, something happening somewhere in a single name or a group of names or the housing sector where someone has to raise money, they need to raise a lot of liquidity from the most liquid names they own. Look, I look at 2022, it wasn't that event like flat on, but it was the event where, wait, Rates are going up. I hadn't planned for this. This is, I, I just need to raise some cash. Amazon, down 50. Apple, down 28 or something. Google, down 30. Because everyone owns those. And everyone can just keep those. Look, everyone can just sell the queues, right? The queues are massively liquid. You want to raise money, you just puke the queues. That's going to hit those big five, six stocks the most at, at, in that context. Um, but it's, you know, sell what you can when you can, right? And I think it's easier to do that with the big tech that everybody owns than with Exxon Mobil. You're not getting a lot of people saying, oh my God, I'm going to puke Exxon because I'm too long Exxon. I don't think there's enough people who are too long Exxon. So I want to ask you, what gives you confidence, Mark, that the following won't happen? Just the trend of ESG continues. Every single 85-year-old, most 85-year-olds, who have a, a nest egg, they probably don't have a lot of concerns about oil or coal, and they may o own oil or coal. You know, they, they're, they're retired. They're uh, drawing down upon their savings. Every 20, most 25-year-olds, uh, they are growing their savings, and they don't like investing in Exxon. They like buying these uh, ESG funds. And, you know, uh, that, that view just becomes more and more dominant. I mean, you know, people have been trashing passive for, for many, many years saying, oh my God, Apple is under-owned in 2014. I'm going to buy my, you know, value stocks that actually aren't that good companies. Um, and, you know, Apple, Apple has won. Like, what gives you confidence that this is going to be 
the turning point because it seems like it's this big wave that uh, it's hard for it to stop. To, to stop. Right. So the first shot across the bow was last year and returns. Okay. Because returns really drive people's emotions, right? They look at their P&L, they're like, okay, whatever happened here was the best and I'm the smartest, bull market. Whatever happened here was the worst and I'm the dumbest, bear market. So last year was the first um, shot across the bow in terms of um, ESG performance being pretty negative, down 20, 25, down 30. And that sort of opened people's eyes. Now, my recent research, and I reviewed a white paper um, written by you know, some esteemed academics, NYU and Stanford, Georgetown. And, um, anyway, uh, they came up with a recent paper. It was actually sent to me by um, Aswath Damodaran from NYU. He said, Mark, take a look at this, read this, whatever. He's been on the show, yeah. Yeah, he, he's on, I, I did an interview with him, YouTube too. He's a great guy. We've become pen pals. But in this article, there were some distinct um, uh, aspects to the ESG investor. The correlation towards ESG was higher for younger, as you pointed out right there, um, relatively wealthier, relatively Democrat. Um, and it was sort of like you pointed out very astutely there, Jack, the older crowd, they, they're not willing to say, hey, take my money and apply it to something that I can't really understand or gauge or, you know, really get my arms around the, the impact. I just want to you know, get good returns and, and, and own companies that I know. That's the older crowd that you point out. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting, and it goes to sort of what, what scenario does it in, increase or continue or, or maybe not, the younger crowd is willing to pay up for ESG investments in the case of sort of like virtue and also being guilty. Like, I'm guilty, I feel shame. So those investors in the younger crowd, they're willing to pay up. They're willing to sacrifice some returns uh, in the name of like doing good and, 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 and being uh, a steward of positive things in the ESG environment. And those are great things. The only, um, the question I have is, is it really, um, can you really touch the reason, point to the reason why those investments are better and, and doing better overall net net in the end? And I can't really answer that in like two seconds, but I think it's something to to continue to debate. Now, in terms of it sticking around and it lasting. And it accelerating in the same way, you know, 10 years ago, passive was 25% and now it's over 50%. I, I'm making those numbers up. But, right. Yeah. And, and, and I think like anything that lasts so long eventually has to come to an end. Um, but here's an interesting anecdote. Okay. I, I did some work and found that like, you know, 80% or maybe it's more now of the S&P 500 companies have their pay tied to to ESG. But uh, one of the things I've learned here in Georgia in the farming world um, is that some of the big producers and big consumers of product that put out, you know, end products, um, they have room in their budget now to pay up a little bit, to be compliant with ESG or improve their ESG scores. Now, this goes one step further to that big company going and getting, um, you know, go, going and improving, uh, sorry, going and having the budget to, you know, um, consume environmentally friendly chocolate or whatever, or, or produce or whatever it is, they then go to the bank and get better banking rates, perhaps because of their improved scores. And this is what perpetuates the cycle. That's fair point. And I think it's um, a, a good point to make, Jack. Um, I would just say that if returns continue to suffer, if there is struggle within the business community of, hey, what's the point here? We lost money last year. We had 37 chief people officers as, a, as an L in P&L. That's not going to work for the longevity of this company. That's where you'll start to see the further pushback. Look, in the end, ESG is an important element to your risk management process. It is by no means the panacea, end all, be all. It becomes just another factor to your investing process, in my opinion. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure uh, get, getting you on to, to hear about ESG. You've really been kicking the tires. Uh, you can people find find you on Twitter at Mark Newman N E U M A N eighteen. Tell us about Hero, uh, uh, your your new farming venture, and where can people find out more about that? 
Oh, awesome. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. So, you know, the transition I've made recently is towards real measurable ESG. And I connected down here. I live in Atlanta now two years. I connected with a, um, a farmer, former Wall Street guy from years ago, but um, he runs an organic farm. And he and I have been talking for quite a while. Ironically, he had an ETF, a commodity ETF, about a dozen years ago or so that did very well. And, and, and he sort of parlayed that into expanding his farm. But he is an organic farmer and he does, he produces quality, clean, non GMO and organic goods. And it's measurable in the soil content, the nitrogen and, and, and uh, carbon sequestration, use of water, runoff of water. So it's true, real measurable ESG. We've been able to take soil samples and say, prior to our application of this fertilizer, our content in nitrogen and carbon was this, our use of water was that. And then on the back end, uh, you know, six months, a year later, we see the improvements and the result is better uh, impact on the environment and better service of products to the consumer. So HERO stands for healing the environment, regenerating ourselves. So for me, it's sort of this ESG expertise and what are the pros and cons of ESG, now applying it to real life um, farming down here in Atlanta. And it's super interesting because not only does it help the suppliers, the producers, the farms themselves, but it also, we're working in the community to do some outreach and some education and make our products available accessible to local and historically underserved communities um, to give them access to high quality foods and actually on some level interestingly enough supplant their consumption of say coke and pepsi and potato chips and replace it with high quality organic non-gmo uh, proteins and vegetables and produce that we produce um, so it's really um translating the esg experience into real community impact and uh, sustainability and regenerative farming. It's pretty cool. And so that your farm and your, your store, is it in Atlanta? So the farm is based in, um, we have we have one big farm based in um, Southern, Southern Georgia with like five or six member farms in that little group. And then we have uh, our offices are in Atlanta. We have our butcher shop and distribution center in nearby Atlanta. And um, yeah, it's sort of like basically making the supply chain, vertically integrated supply chain um, with, like I said, real measurable ESG impact, uh, both on the environment side and the social side and the governance too. We have some board members from diverse backgrounds that give us a real uh, broad perspective on sort of what the community needs and uh, you know where the um, greatest impact can be felt and be made. That's Really cool. I, I haven't checked it out, but I, but I want to. So people, uh, if, they're, if they're in the area, they should check it out. Mark, if I, if, just to apply your criticism of ESG to to that farm, like, uh, so in other words, how are I presume you know organic and anything that's better is typically more expensive. So who is who is funding that? And to the extent, are, are any companies funding that? And might they be funding that because it improves their ESG score? Yeah, that's a, um, there's a lot there in that question, but yes, um, you know, on the, uh, on the um, overall impact side, you know, we have been able to, like I say, measure the inputs and measure the processes um, to really actually, we're working with some experts from the uh, NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service Center, and they have the skills and the ability to do the measuring of the soil and basically the improving of the byproducts and the runoff into the sort of um, streams and rivers nearby. Um, so that's pretty tangible. You know, as we um, produce, say, organic grains, it changes the handling of those products in terms of what we call scope three ESG criteria, your investments and how you handle um, products on a sort of secondary tertiary level in relation. And so we, we, we handle a lot of grain. And we have those who are consumers of grain consuming, let's say, higher scoring ESG product, organically raised, more conservative, better impact on the environment. So there are companies that have uh, an appetite, pun intended, I guess, to purchase some of these commodities that have a better ESG score. So it improves and they can say, look, we are procuring these grains as part of our process, and they are 
environmentally better impacting than what we did traditionally. And so we're making those innovations and those changes. Um, you know, and we're actually working with, uh, with the government in some cases to help support these local, organic, urban, you know, historically underserved farmers. So anybody in the area, in the region, that has a farm from one acre to five acres to 10, to, to the bigger ones, you know, can get access to our expertise. We've been farming for 20 plus years, more maybe, and then our um, technical abilities and a little bit of financial assistance to help them transition to organic, to improve their organic or improve their environmental impact, if you will, and work better in their communities. So it's really a, um, you know, in the end, measurable and those people getting involved really seem to care about creating this sort of sustainable, repeatable event based on sort of how we treat the environment on the way in and how we narrow the supply chain, cut out the middleman, right? That's how we really make it more cost effective. We're going from farm, our farms, to our food center, if you will, where people in the community have access. So we're eliminating distance traveled, miles used, energy used to get from point A to point B. And that's really the um, crux of our societal benefit, if you will, from the farmers to the consumers. And but so do, have any companies who you purchase stuff from you or maybe in the future, do you think that they might do so for ESG reasons? So oh, I want to be in the Larry Fink's ESGU. So I'm going to do this deal. Yes. Um, and then that's where, you know, your original, or well, not original, but previous question about how big is the movement and is it here to stay? Yeah. You know, a big part of this push is part of the um, the soil health bill, which came a couple years ago, and the Biden Inflation Reduction Act for his, whatever we want to talk about, the title of that act, they have allocated fair bits of money to promoting uh, organic, local, historically underserved, you know, demographically challenged, let's say, uh, communities to really step up. It's almost as if there is a little element of let's help and save the smaller farmers and hopefully return to higher quality outputs, you know, hand, hand produced as opposed to machine produced, to, to use a sort of example. Um, and that is where the pushback continues. And I think that as the communities, communities can sort of see the benefit both in both in production and in consumption and in the byproducts, if you will, or the reduction of, there's there's room for this to grow further. And I think that um, you know, if enough people got the education and understanding, the um overall, you know, community benefit and further expansion of this movement can proliferate further. Well, Mark, pleasure uh, getting you on and thanks for, for sharing your insights. Thanks everyone for watching. Alex, uh, Jack, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it, mate.